Michael Larson. One distinction has to be made, I think, is significant, and that's fiction and nonfiction. In fiction, you can see a lot of this throwaway books, books you read once and don't want to own. It's a nonfiction book that's got continuing value. You're more likely to want that in, in hard copy. Um, also, another has been said about enriched books and the potential they have to generate more income because you're adding value by adding media to them. So. Did everybody hear that? Any discussion on that point? The difference between fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, well, just to build on what Michael said, um, we have Roman Publishing. We have some very old books that haven't had a word changed. One of them, um, it's it's a marijuana book, marijuana botany, with the horrific uh, competition. These books are popping out every five minutes. We've been selling that book for twenty four ninety five, and it sells, and it sells, and it sells. We have another one for thirty-eight ninety-five, and it's thirty years old too. So you can uh, raise the I'm price. Very resistant. To thirty-eight ninety-nine. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Four digits, not thirty. But uh, you know, we don't all have to bow. I mean, Kindle and Apple are getting us to give them the content to sell their devices. That's what's happening. We, we don't actually know either how Amazon is doing. They're very well, we secretive. They're, doing, exactly, they're, they're very secretive about their numbers. They, they never, have a lot of rules about, yeah. uh, not, uh, not Amazon, but, but Apple. I mean, I think Marlowe knows better about this. But you, you know, you can't, you can't have a book that has been sold for 20 years. Yeah. Or Speaking of Amazon, Amazon, I feel, is the, is the hairy elephant, the gorilla, is in the middle of the room. I hope that you're all aware. I was recently at the Book Expo in New York, you know, formerly known as the ABA, and it was announced, what everyone was talking about at that uh, conference, at that big event, was that Larry Kirschenbaum had been hired by Amazon to head up their publishing division. What does that mean? Well, it means that Amazon is trying to conquer the world. They really are so predominant now as an influence in the book business. They announced at the same book expo that week at their booth, which had the biggest booths in the entire exhibitors hall, several of them all over, that they had like six new imprints. They're doing a mystery line. They're doing a, a line of international translations. They're doing backlist books that have been out for a while that are sort of out of print for a while, that are either getting the rights to or a public domain. Amazon, by hiring Kirschenbaum, I think has signaled that they are going to compete for brand name authors like, um, you know, John Grisham and, and uh, Daniel Steele and Stephen King are going to be under the Amazon imprint, not Random House or Doubleday or not or Simon and Chester, but Amazon. Think of it. It's really quite uh, a prospect. I don't know, maybe I'm being paranoid or delusional, but there's something, <laughs> if you know Jeff Bezo, has anybody, does anybody seen him in public or know him up close and personal? He's a maniac. He is a, 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 a very, very driven and intense guy who uh, has very, uh, very interesting goals, which he pursues relentlessly. And very much like Stephen, like, you know, Steve Jobs and some other people, although He's not quite as charming, uh, and he, he gets what he wants, and his primary goal is the, is the company, you know, the company, so that he does things that publishers haven't really appreciated for years, and he's continuing to do so, including, I think now, competing avidly and putting the whole book business uh, 
very much more in the new age, including ebooks and so forth. And you mentioned return to the ground. One thing also hasn't been mentioned today is the espresso root machine. Uh, I think the publishing community should partner with book, independent booksellers to put these machines in stores. So instead of having 20 copies of one book, they'll have one copy of 20 books. You go in and order and have a coffee and come out with a book. That's got to be part of the future. And Everybody knows about the espresso book machine. It's a uh, instant book machine. You know, it's not it's not inexpensive. So some bookstores have them. Is that right, Michael? Uh, six is the number I heard. Yeah. Six zero. On Amazon, actually, yeah, it's basically a print on demand, and it only at this point delivers paperback books. Yeah. Right. And is it a standard format? Are they beautiful? Or are they customized in any way? But they're all the same. Yeah. It's a beginning. Other comments, questions? Yes, Adrian. Hi. Um, I just wanted to maybe switch the conversation just a little bit um, in a different direction since many of us are marketers and publicists here. And, um, coming from a long history of book publicity, I've noticed a real swing in the ways that we're doing outreach. Where it used to be an author or a publisher would contact a freelancer like me and say, who do you know at the New York Times? Can you get me on Oprah? And they would suggest kind of a pay-for-play kind of thing. If you can get me on Oprah, then we'll give you a lump sum. And I, I never took those kinds of uh, jobs because in our business, results really are never promised or guaranteed. Uh, what I wanted to comment on was things have really shifted now in that I got a call a couple weeks ago from a very prominent um, name brand businessman here in San Francisco. This is one of his hotels. and. Um, he asked me, not who I knew at the New York Times, if I could get him on Oprah. He asked me, how quickly can you get me 30,000 Twitter followers? Yeah. Yeah. And um, to me, that was a pay, pay for play kind of thing, all, but a whole new landscape. And I told him you know, that that is not really something I was interested in doing. I was more about quality over quantity. And I realized that might make me a little bit of a dinosaur. But you know, anybody can get 30,000 followers. Are they really? following you? Are you engaging with them? Are they really benefiting from your expertise that you are sharing with them on your Twitter feed? So things are definitely changing. 30,000 is a big number for Twitter followers. Yeah. I, I don't think it's that easy to no. get. And, but that was his expectation. Yeah, well that's... So I declined it. Yeah, well that was probably wise. But I, but I, I just wanted to say that it's not, it's not easy to get 30,000 no. followers. And some of the biggest names around, uh, uh, Conrath, Joe J. Conrath or Nathan Bransford, they have nowhere near that many followers, but they're very influential. Because once you get a follower, then the follower has followers, and it, right. it's just sort of a viral effect, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add something to um, how publishing has changed. I mean, one of the things that's been a big topic today is uh, what do people who are thinking about self-publishing, what's the value in them to go with a publisher? Um, and I'm a publicity coordinator, and uh, so much of what we do now is really just consulting. Just teaching authors, this is how you set up a website. This is what you need on your Facebook. Yes, we need to blog regularly. One blog is enough, you know. Um, and I've seen examples even from talking to book bloggers about this. Uh, there's one in particular on Twitter who uh, loves to just share all of her gossip on Twitter, um, who posted the other day that she was really angry that this author reached out to her directly on Twitter. Hey, read my book. Um, and I saw the backlash from that, and then of course they got into this battle, and I thought, where is this author's publicist right now? Are they freaking out? Do they have one? Are they self-published? And they were self-published. Um, and if that author had a publicist, that publicist definitely would have told them the way to go about it. Probably wouldn't have caused that backlash. What would you have said, actually? Because the whole question of how to, how to not blatantly, explicitly sell is part of the etiquette of online marketing yeah. for an author. How, what do you advise your authors to do in that case as a, as a marketer or publicist? That's a great question. Um, I probably wouldn't have told the author to go to the book, to the book publicist direct, or to the book blogger directly and said, hey, read my book. I think that you have to treat any person. I would never go up to somebody in a shopping mall and say, hey, read my book, and throw it in their face, which is kind of like what you're doing in Twitter. Um, you have to have some finesse. You have to reach out to people in a polite way and don't just assume that they're there to use you, which was actually the point of the book blogger is that she just felt like she was being used. She felt like 
authors had found out that she could she could uh, give them publicity and you know there are right way wrong good or right and wrong ways to go after any any uh, something that are often something that they're going to want to read the book they're going to want to say great things about it but you never want to be really promotional and say buy my book or you should be reading my book because that's a total turn off when we would be producing a segment and this author keeps saying in my book we cut it short because that's a big commercial who wants to watch a commercial what can you give me what's interesting that's why i want to get in the book yeah. i'd like to comment on digital etiquette uh, for a moment because this is something that um i experience a lot with my authors um i think first of all people forget that anything that you put online is out there. Like any photo, any comment you make, you have to be really careful. I mean, I think that we all on some level are sort of becoming our own brands. So um, I had an author who um, decided to write a negative blog post about an important person um, an important reporter at the Washington Post the day that she was going on The Daily Show um, and she had endorsed his book. So she was obviously uh, very upset, um, you know, and I advised him to apologize, whatnot. Um, immediately I jumped in and, you know, with what you were saying about, like, as his publicist, I jumped in. Uh, did he listen? No. But... <laughs> You know, it definitely didn't um, hurt, you know, to at least, you know, hear what I had to say because he didn't do it again. So um, I think that the whole reason people hire publicists is that we're not advertising. You know, we're here to help you tell your story in a subtle way with finesse and to get people interested. And like you were saying, it's not, hey, you know, buy my book, because that's an advertisement. It's about providing valuable content, information that people want. And, um, you know, I think this connects back to what we were discussing earlier, is why, you know, if I can be self-published, why would I want to hire a publicist when I can do that? You know, we're here to help you tell your story in a way that sells your book, in a way that gets other people interested. Um, and I think that in this new landscape, we just need to be really careful. You know, there is an etiquette that we're all trying to figure out, but I think the golden rule is like treat others how you would want to be treated, whether it's online, in person, on the phone. 